The American Meteorological Society's policy program is supported, in part, by a public-private partnership. The Climate Briefing Series is made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation's Paleo Climate Program. Every molecule of CO2, if you want to remove it from the atmosphere, you have to deal with each molecule. So anything you do has to be on the same scale as the system that releases the CO2. So all of these carbon dioxide removal systems are basically on the same scale as our energy system. I think the worst case would be where we kind of all agree to look the other way and pretend this is impossible. People develop a kind of fits and starts research program that may make this look better than, than it really is. And then we have some supposed climate crisis and perception of reality 20 or 30 years out and people want to act suddenly in a way that's ill thought out and dangerous. And I think that the way to prevent that is to have a more systematic open research program. It doesn't have to be large at the beginning, but I think that's crucial. Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. We know you have many uh, competing claims on your time and very much appreciate you taking time out of busy schedules to be with us here today. I'm Paul Higgins with the American Meteorological Society's policy program and I'll be moderating the discussion today. Well, in the broadest sense, our nation has three risk management strategies available for dealing with climate change. We can reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases, climate change mitigation. We can increase our capacity to cope with changes in climate that lie ahead or climate change adaptation. Or we can think about large scale manipulation of the Earth system, geoengineering, in the hopes of counteracting at least some of the consequences of climate change. Of these three, geoengineering has had relatively little attention particularly in the policy process, but also within the scientific community to some degree. I think that's uh, in part because some have been concerned that talking about geoengineering will distract from mitigation and adaptation. And in part, uh, that represents a concern about some geoengineering strategies and the potential risk of unintended consequences that they bring. Well, the, the goal of this AMS climate briefing series is to bring knowledge and understanding to the federal policy process to the, to the extent that we possibly can. And with that goal, it makes a lot of sense for us to focus in today on the topic of geoengineering so that we can all better understand it. We're extremely fortunate to have with us two of the leading experts on the topic to help us better understand it. Ken Caldera is a climate scientist with the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology. He is also a professor by courtesy in the Department of Environmental Earth System Sciences at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Ken Caldera. Uh, let me start off by saying that I am an academic uh, research scientist and not an economist or politically savvy person. So, uh, you know, what, what I'll say is, is mostly of a technical nature. Uh, so you're going to hear two presentations today. One is about carbon dioxide removal, and then David Keith is going to speak about the idea of reflecting sunlight to space. And both of these are aimed at reducing the consequences of greenhouse gases that have already been admit, emitted into the environment. But that's a, about the only connection between these two things, other than they're both understudied. So some of these methods I'm about to talk about you're familiar with, others may be new to you. But there's, there are many different proposed approaches to removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But even the best of these approaches are slow, in the sense that 
Uh, you know, we've been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for decades to centuries, and it would likely take decades to centuries to pull it back out. So the, these uh, carbon dioxide removal processes are not something you could do quickly if there was an emergency. On the other hand, these uh, methods do have the advantage that they're effective in the sense that the uh, they Ocean acidification and climate change is caused by carbon dioxide. So by decreasing those concentrations in the atmosphere, removing the excess carbon dioxide, you really get at the root cause of this uh, climate change and ocean acidification. Unfortunately, that there are some things that like, in cer certain circumstances can be cheap and effective, like planting a tree. But those uh, things might not be scalable up to the huge volumes that might be necessary. The things that seem to be scalable up to huge volumes appear not to be inexpensive. And so uh, you know, there's no sort of magic bullet here, at least that anybody's found so far, of something that's cheap and scalable and so on. On the other hand, for the most part, these things are safe uh, in, in the sense that there might be local environmental concerns if you wanted to do some geologic carbon storage. You, you need to make sure that the reservoirs are sound and safe and so on, but the, the kinds of environmental and safety issues are associated with local processes and, the, and, and that these processes for the most part do not introduce new kinds of governance or other kind of complex geopolitical issues. So what's the basic idea? That the, you know, the earth uh, gets heated by the sun and then that energy radiates back to space and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere make it more difficult for those, uh, that radiation to go back to space. And so the sunlight reflection methods work on this side here. You know, I mean, the carbon dioxide removal options, I'm sorry, work on this side here uh, of helping the atmosphere lose its heat uh, back to space more easily. So this is actually a, mid, uh, a, a fossil fuel number from a middle of the last, uh, average of the last decade, and so today we're releasing probably closer to 120 pounds of carbon dioxide per day, but at least from fossil fuels so over the past decades, uh, on average each American released around 100 pounds of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each day. A and, and we can talk about this in many ways, and I'm not pretending that these carbon dioxide re removal methods will be the only thing that we deploy, but just to kind of get the feeling of the scales we're talking about, just you know, to get that idea in your head that we're talking about 100 pounds of CO2 for each American each day. And then we could see, well, which of these methods could we possibly scale up to you know, take a significant chunk of those scales? So where does the carbon dioxide come from? That uh, the vast majority of the excess carbon dioxide comes from the burning of coal, oil, and gas, and a significant fraction comes from land cover change, mostly deforestation. So where does it go? Well, around 45%, almost half of it, is, remains in the atmosphere. So sort of about half as mo the atmospheric increase each year is about half of what we release to the atmosphere each year. And about a quarter of that CO2 that we release goes into the land uh, each year, both from forest regrowth and some of CO2 fertilization. And about a quarter goes into the ocean. And so the question for a lot of these carbon dioxide removal systems is, can, are there ways to make it so that fraction going into the atmosphere is smaller and put more of that either in the land or the ocean? And on the land, it could go either underground or into living things. So one basic point is that really this carbon dioxide removal is the inverse or the opposite of emissions. And you could think about this if you had a power plant with carbon capture and storage, sucking CO2 out of at the power plant and putting it underground. That, and, and then think of a second case. So we have the first case would be the power plant, you do carbon capture and storage, and it just never gets released to the atmosphere. The second case is you have a power plant releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, but someplace else you have a, a carbon capture system that's pulling that same amount of CO2 out of the atmosphere and sticking it, say, underground somewhere else that for the climate system, those are the same things because CO2 gets well mixed, uh, pretty well mixed in the atmosphere and really it's just the net addition. And so, so really an emissions with a removal is, is for the climate system basically equivalent to an avoided emission. So 
you can imagine different taxonomies. I'm just presenting one taxonomy here. And that uh, the way I like to think about it is that there are, you can think about centralized approaches or distributed approaches. And by centralized approaches, I'm thinking of, of industrial scale facilities as basically a factory designed to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then there are distributed approaches which require large spatial extents that you're going to do something over a huge area. And, that, and those things you can do over a huge area could themselves be biological approaches or chemical approaches. And the bio, biological approaches have some appeal because we know that trees already take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and remove the carbon from that carbon dioxide to make you know, their branches and tree trunks and so on. And so there's already, nature has already created a, an atmospheric CO2 capture system, so why not use those? And then the geochemical approaches are similar in that sense in that uh, on the scale of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, the CO2 that we add to the atmosphere will get removed ultimately from reactions between the carbon dioxide and minerals. And, and so maybe there's ways to accelerate those reactions. So, Coming up with subcategories among those biological approaches, we can think of growing trees and storing that uh, carbon in land ecosystems. But if you do that, you only get to use that ecosystem for once, right? There's all this land area, you're growing the trees. If you just, if you want to keep that carbon stored, you'd have to keep that forest there forever and you, you don't store anything additional. And so some people have suggested taking that carbon and burying it somewhere. Others have suggested, well, why not put, use the, rather than just burying it, why not burn it in a power plant and then capture that carbon from the power plant and store that underground so you get both electricity and, and CO2 removal. And then the last one, which is perhaps the most controversial here, is the idea of fertilizing the ocean. So I'll just go into each of these very briefly. So, you know, the basic idea is to, uh, for, for afforestation or reforestation, is to plant forests and um, you know that you know so each uh, sort of one of these sort of good sized trees probably has something like a ton of carbon in it for you know for each person uh, you know that forests take up a lot of carbon for the first few decades of their growth and, and uh, you know so each person would need you know several acres worth of land to take up uh, carbon you know, for, e for each person's admission. And so you might think like each family of four might need something like 10 acres. And then after the, that 30 years of strong growth, they need to now get the second 10 acres and keep on adding to that forever. And so you can see that the, the land use for just the most um, straightforward, uh, car you know, land uh, carbon removal through forests is limited. Uh, on the other hand, there's all kinds of co-benefits of re restoring natural ecosystems and place for biodiversity and so on. And so, so uh, you know, there, there might be multiple objectives achieved through afforestation. Uh, another idea, which I mentioned, is this idea that you have a power plant here. And this might be a coal plant that you're co-firing with some added biomass. And then you have a carbon capture and storage system to put some of that carbon underground. And, and in this way, you would both, uh, so you'd use the, the forest as your air capture technique, generate some electricity with it, displacing some fossil fuel and uh, storing some of the carbon underground. And so the, uh, you know, this seems to have multiple co-benefits of electricity, potential uh, biodiversity co-benefits and then also removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And you get to reuse this land over and over because you're constantly growing younger stuff that is then uh, going to the power plant. There's a sort of intermediate uh, strategy which has gotten some attention. And that's this idea of biochar, which means, which means you sort of burn some of it and bury some of it. And the argument here is that in some places, adding uh, charcoal-like substance to the soils can improve soil properties. And then you can get some energy out of partially burning this, this uh, material. Now, I think there have been some economic analyses that done of this and that, that the cost of collecting farm waste or scrap biomass becomes pretty high. And that 
for certain cases, like in sugarcane mills, where you've already collected biomass and you've got, you know, you've pressed out the sugar, sugar water, and you're just left with this, uh, these kind of stalks. That that in those cases, doing this kind of processing might be economic, but that that it, that uh, collecting all the biomass might be quite a challenge. So the the most controversial in this area is this idea of ocean fertilization. And there's been about a dozen experiments where people have gone out into the ocean and added iron. And this fertilizes the plankton uh, in the surface ocean in some parts of the ocean. And then the plankton sinks deep into the ocean after they've taken up some carbon. And so some CO2 comes into the ocean from the atmosphere to replace the carbon taken up from the plankton. And it's thought that if you did this over huge spatial areas, say 10% or more of the ocean, that you might be able to withdraw a few percent of the CO2 that we're emitting to the atmosphere. And so it, it seems that it's marginally effective, but uh, that it has unknown environmental consequences. And also there are difficult governance issues because you're toying with a global commons. And all these previous things we discussed, somebody presumably owns the land, whereas the ocean you know, it starts being an international issue. Now, there, this is being addressed under the uh, uh, International Maritime Organization under the London Convention and London Protocol. But uh, anyway, it, it seems marginally effective, but not that uh, likely to be a substantial contribution to climate change risk mitigation. Okay, so going down this uh, trajectory here, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about these geochemical approaches. and. Uh, and there, those really could be divided again into two main categories. And one is to enhance weathering of rocks on land, and the other is to add alkalinity to the oceans. The, um, so on the natural, uh, in the natural course of the carbon cycle, the CO2 that we release to the atmosphere over hundreds of thousands of years will get removed from the atmosphere through the weathering of silicate rocks. And so this reaction is kind of a simplification of this, but basically CO2 reacts with the silicate rock and eventually that goes into the ocean and some organism makes a shell out of calcium carbonate and then there's silica, which is more as glass or what a lot of sand is made out of. And this reaction normally takes hundreds of thousands of years, but the thought is that if you took the silicate rock and ground it up very finely and maybe added it to soils as an amendment, uh, say, on, in farming situations where people are already spreading fertilizers and other things, that it might be a cost-effective uh, way to do some CO2 removal. Now, just to bear in mind, again, if this sort of CO2 is around 100 pounds per person per day, that, uh, you know, that this uh, here is um, going to weigh a couple hundred pounds a day. And so you're talking, you know, for each person's CO2 removal that you want to do through this method, you're going to have to mine and grind up a few hundred pounds of minerals. And so it's not likely to be particularly cheap. The same thing, uh, similar idea as adding alkalinity to the oceans. I'm not going to go through all these reactions, but it's a similar idea that, uh, the sort of the first half of that cycle I just described that the uh, that CO2 naturally reacts with minerals and groundwaters and these reactions take tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years but eventually those dissolved solids go into the ocean and then where they're eventually taken up by marine organisms but uh, doing this is a, but so we could if we could accelerate these weathering reactions and add alkalinity to the oceans that would both deal with the ocean acidification problem and store some CO2 in the oceans. Again, it's basically just a mass uh, term, uh, mass problem, in that, again, if each of this is sort of on the order of 100 pounds a day, you're going to have to be grinding up for each person a couple hundred pounds of stuff a day and adding it to the ocean, and so it's not a small thing. So, I mean, uh, we're trying to keep these things separate because they are really different, but one of the differences between chemistry and physics is that for chemistry, for every molecule of CO2, if you want to remove it from the atmosphere, you have to deal with each molecule. So anything you do has to be on the same scale as the system that releases the CO2. So all of these carbon dioxide removal systems are basically on the same scale as our energy system. I mean, they might be a, a bit bigger, a bit smaller, but that's sort of the scale of operation. And the difference is that physics, you, each 
particle in the stratosphere is a multiplier and can mul send back many photons. And so I don't want to mix up these two things, but what we're talking about here is chemistry and there are no silver bullets here. There are things that might be cost effective, there are things that might be useful, but there, there's no magic solutions here. Okay, so we went through the distributed approaches, now I'm gonna do briefly the centralized approaches, or of which there's really basically one, and this is an artist's conception. This is not an existing object, I should point out. But the basic idea is that, uh, you know, air comes through these uh, uh, devices and there's some kind of chemical exchanger that absorbs CO2 into a fluid and then you have some kind of industrial process going on in the background to remove the CO2 from this fluid. And then once you have the pure CO2, you can do uh, different things with it. One thing you can do with it is the same thing with conventional carbon capture and storage from power plants, compress it and send it underground. The other thing you could do with it is potentially, let's say this were sitting next to a nuclear power plant, uh, hopefully a safer design than what they have in Japan, and, and um, you know, you're making, say, hydrogen using this nuclear power and then combining that with the carbon coming out of this uh, device and making, say, aviation fuels or fuels for long distance trucking and so on. And so, so this, uh, atmospheric CO2 capture could be a way of making carbon neutral liquid fuels that uh, could be very useful. So, but again, the atmosphere is only 0.04% CO2, and so, uh, you know, if we said, okay, we have 100 pounds of carbon dioxide per day, you say, well, how much atmosphere do I need to process to get those 100 pounds out? And I first put it in gallons, and then I had no idea what millions of gallons were like, so then I thought acre feet. And so it's on the order of 200 acre feet a day. So you know, if, if you think of like an area of an acre and then a volume of air 200 feet high in that, that's sort of the volume that would contain the amount of CO2 that needs to be drawn out. But if you're only getting, say, 10% on each pass through that device, you might need to process 10 times that volume. It's of the order of magnitude of the volume of the Capitol building per person per day. So it's, again, none of these things, I mean, the main thing is we're putting out lots of CO2, so to try to pull that back in is a formidable challenge. So anyway, that was my little taxonomy of carbon dioxide removal approaches. What I would like to say is that none of them, uh, you know, that all of these, are, none of them are crazy in the sense that none of them, they're all, you know, our understanding of physics and chemistry and climate systems say all of these things should work. Uh, that uh, there, so there's a question of how much will these things cost and how much can you scale these things up before other fa factors limited scale up. But some things, I mean, where it makes sense to restore a forest for other reasons, the idea that you're getting carbon storage additionally is a good co-benefit if in some cases you might want to add biochar to soils to improve soil properties, if you can get carbon storage out of it, that's a good co-benefit. There's also, I guess I'll leave it to David to talk about other sort of further in the future places where you might want to deploy these kinds of systems. Uh, oh yeah, so the, the, the Royal Society uh, a couple of years ago did a report on geoengineering options where they included both carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management. And this you can think of as affordability, which is inverse of cost. So these things are less expensive, more expensive. Effectiveness, you could also think of uh, this as being sort of how much you could scale it up. So this is small scale, large scale. And so they're sort of planting trees, afforestation, they're sort of relatively inexpensive, but there's, relative, there's limited amount of land that you could actually convert back to forests. That uh, the, these um, sort of this idea of spreading minerals around or industrially capturing CO2 from the air, both could be done at, at, at large scale, but don't appear to be particularly expensive. And then down here, you get other things that are neither particularly cheap nor particularly scalable. But this, I direct you to this Royal Society report uh, if you want more detail on this. So, but my main, so my main conclusions is really, I, my conclusion of all this is that if we wanna avoid, uh, reduce climate risk Climate damage, avoiding emissions is a lot easier than sucking the CO2 out later. Uh, but that it does, uh, the carbon dioxide removal does remove the cause of climate change and ocean acidification. And so, you know, where it makes sense to do it, it would be useful to do it. Uh, 
uh, and that there are many approaches that people have suggested, and, and I'm sure there are more approaches that I didn't mention. And one of the things I would like to say is that scientists and engineers have had a terrible track record of predicting which technologies will ultimately succeed in future marketplaces. And so I'm a big fan for portfolio-based approaches where you, know, you, you set out the metrics of what you're trying to achieve, but not how you're trying to achieve it. And, and if something makes thermodynamic sense, well, let's investigate and see if there are ways to bring costs down, but, but not to filter too much too early because what you think might work might not have been the best thing. So anyway, but right now, no approach is obviously both cheap and scalable. I just put the word obviously there because some of these things could potentially become cheap or become scalable with more research. Okay. The best of these things introduce no new kinds of risks. In other words, they introduce some risks, but they're the kind of risks that we deal with already. And I would say that sort of the ocean fertilization one might be the only one where it really does introduce a new kind of risk. Um, that, yeah, especially with things like uh, planting trees where, you know, that there might be some opportunities for low cost mitigation, but the, that amount of stuff that could be done at low cost is probably limited. And some of these can be deployed today or soon. We know how to plant a tree. And many of these, I would even go for, so far as to say most of these are understudied and, and uh, there are really no research programs in looking at most of the things I've discussed today. And so I think that would be good if that void would be uh, removed. So with no further ado, I'll hand it over to David Keith. David Keith is Canada Research Chair in Energy and Environment in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Calgary. Please join me in welcoming David Keith. I'll start with this topic by uh, giving you a little bit of history. And history is relevant here because one of the sort of central facts that I'll come back to in, in various ways in this talk is the sense in which there's been a broad knowledge fundamentally that this idea, which I'm going to use the acronym SRM, Solar Radiation Management, that this idea was possible has been known for a long time. But there's been essentially no research program. And that has consequences, good or bad, depending on what you think the outcomes are. But the consequences are profound in shaping the current situation. And so I'll sort of start by uh, uh, taking you back in history a little bit and emphasizing that and then uh, explaining a little bit about what this idea is, what the uncertainties are, before saying a little bit about what the characteristics of, I think, a US federal research program, what sort of characteristics that you might want to bear in mind are. OK, um, so just in terms of history, uh, this is the first major report that went to a US president that had all the kind of climate science right as we now understand it and basically told you enough climate science to say you had a serious problem if you kept putting CO2 in the air. And that went to President Johnson uh, in 65. And um, I, I like it because it's nice and short. Now we write much bigger reports, but they're not necessarily much better. And one of the very few things it, it suggested doing about this was something we now basically call SRM, changing the reflectivity of the Earth in various ways. So the basic underlying idea that this was possible is not remotely new. It's been known for a long time. But for many decades, there was effectively a kind of agreement that we wouldn't talk about it much. Uh, and there has been no organized research program. I'm not saying it was a formal agreement, but effectively. And now we have a situation where there's still no organized research program in the US anyway. Uh, and yet there's increasing attention paid to this, for better or for worse. In some ways, this is, as I said, a dangerous proposition. So this is some trends, uh, citations of academic papers, also Google trends based on people searching for the word geoengineering. And it just gives you some quantitative backup to my claim that suddenly there's a lot of uh, uh, talk going on in this space, although not necessarily really a lot of deep science or technology being done. And we just ran a big public survey uh, where we, <clears throat> you know, this is Canada, US, UK, high quality, thousands of people, uh, a good sampling public survey. And one thing is I, I've sat around a lot of meeting rooms, including meeting rooms in DC on some committees I'm on where people say with confidence that the public doesn't know anything about this. And that actually appears not to be the case. So. When we ask people free form, what is geoengineering, and allow them to like, type an answer, uh, 
or free form, what is climate engineering? Well, for geoengineering, something like 8% of them get it right, and for climate engineering, like 50%. It may depend on the order and so on, but those numbers are very, very surprisingly high. I would have guessed 1% or 2%. In the early days when I worked on public perception of CO2 capture and storage, we would get numbers like 1% or 2% who could correctly answer questions about what it was. So it's, uh, it's startling, and that has some profound implications for how we manage the research process uh, in, in, in D.C. Um, I think the fundamental reason why people have been concerned uh, and why there's been a reluctance to work on this is a very sensible one, in, in, at least in some respects, and that is a, a, a concern that this looks so much like an easy out that if you talk about it much, people will not deal with cutting emissions. And this, there's lots of now public policy literature that says that, but this cartoon, I think, does a better job saying it in a way than any of that literature. So it says, <clears throat> the year 2060, the search for a breakthrough technology to solve climate change continues, and then you see one of the, uh, the uh, um, scientists there saying, it's a time machine we hope will take us back to the time where we should have had a price on carbon. And then the little guys at the bottom always deliver the punchline in Tom Toll's cartoons, say we'd better hurry, and then the final punchline is the guy who says, no, no, that's the great thing about this technology. It doesn't matter when you do it. And <clears throat> that is actually, I'm not, it's not just humorous. In a sense, what both of these technologies do in different ways is allow you to at least partially and imperfectly turn back the clock. To the extent that as we go forward in time and build up CO2 in the atmosphere and build up the climatic risk that comes from high loadings of CO2 in the atmosphere, the ability to take it out or the ability to somehow reduce the impacts by, by reflecting away some sunlight allow you to, 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 in that sense, travel back in time a little bit. And that's precisely the core of, of the public policy issue and concern. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk really just about solar radiation management, but I'm using uh, SRM. I'm using this slide for two reasons. One is just to distinguish how completely different these things are, and I'll come back to that again at the end. And second, to introduce this idea that I think three central characteristics, which I think are pretty much pieces of science, but they have public policy implications that I'll come to. Three central characteristics of solar radiation management are that it's fast, you can do it quickly, that it's cheap, and that it's imperfect and uncertain. And I'll, I'll now say a little bit about those three things and then say what, those, the, what consequences they have for public policy. So uh, this is the same slide Ken had. I'll skip over it. I mean, the basic punchline here is there's nothing, as Ken said, that appears to be both cheap and affordable uh, and safe. So first, fast. <clears throat> we know for sure, not that we could do this at large scale and would work, but that if you put reflective particles in the atmosphere, you will cool the planet down quickly, quickly meaning a year or so. We know that for sure both from basic physics and models, but also nature has essentially tried the experiment. So large volcanoes put sulfur into the atmosphere, not just into the lower atmosphere, but some of it gets into the stratosphere, and there it forms very tiny droplets. These are droplets a fraction of a millionth of a meter, a micron in size. And these droplets scatter sunlight back to space. So they're effectively sulfuric acid uh, sulfuric acid droplets, and, and by scattering sunlight back to space, they reduce the amount of sunlight the, the, the atmospheric system absorbs, and so they cool the planet, and they cool it fast. So within a year or something after the Pinatubo eruption, you saw the planet cool, and we can match the amount it did cool both observations and experiment pretty well and understand the system in some crude way. So that's really quite fundamental. So anything that we do to reduce emissions, which we must do, if we don't reduce emissions, none of these things will get us out of, of risk. Anything we do to reduce emissions only affects the climate risk on timescales of like half a century. That's part of the whole reason that we're so stuck on climate policy is we're asking people, I am asking people, to my fellow citizens, to pay money now to reduce risks that really fall mostly to their grandkids. Because as we cut emissions now, we basically see no immediate environmental benefit. The environmental benefits all build up towards the end of the century. They're very real, they're very important, but the fact is it's slow. One of the fundamental and important facts here is it's fast. And that matters because we don't know how bad the climate problem is. There's a lot of uncertainty about how severe, how much climate change we get for a given amount of CO2 in the air. And that uncertainty can be partially, perhaps, managed by the fact that you can implement these technologies quickly. The second thing is that they're cheap. And <clears throat> I don't say they're cheap just because, you know, I've got one little piece of technology that I believe is cheap, but I think that there's some sort of underlying physics, as, as Ken referred to, that makes it cheap. And that physics really is that it takes a very small amount of material as reflective particles in the stratosphere to offset the, what we call the radiative forcing, the kind of net heating of, of the, 
huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So to give you a sense, uh, a gram or less of sulfur in the atmosphere can offset in radiative effect the effect of a ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. Or another way to say it is you have to lift just twice my mass the stratosphere every second to roughly offset the entire climate impacts of two times CO2, which is, you know, we, which we produce by putting eight billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere every year. So I mean, it, there's a huge amount of leverage there. Um, just to actually put some numbers in, I mean, some of these slides, uh, this slide I've used in various forms for years, but we're now beginning to do a little more research. And among other things, we actually hired, and it's all public, you can download this report, we hired a, a company called Aurora Flight Sciences to do a, a pretty, the first sort of serious end-to-end -end engineers consulting report. This is a company, it's an expert in high-altitude aircraft, really estimating what the cost was to deliver material to stratosphere by various means. And um, they, you know, this is their, their standard business, if you like, not, not geoengineering, but understanding aircraft design. And they looked at a bunch of different new aircraft, old aircraft, what are called pipes and blimps and various things. And, and uh, they did use standard aircraft costing methods, uh, the standard RAND costing methodology, and they got numbers like a billion dollars a year to put a million tons a year in the stratosphere by actually several different methods. And what that says, basically, it's, you know, the report is filled with fun aircraft technology, which you can enjoy if you like technology. Uh, but the, the truth is that number is so small that it's effectively zero. And I'll say a little bit more about why that is. The bottom line is what it means is that the hard decisions about implementing this technology will be driven by risk-to-risk -risk decisions, not cost-benefit decisions. And that way, it's fundamentally different from the decisions we make about cutting emissions or about implementing carbon removal technologies. Um, so let me say a little bit about how well it works. Um, or doesn't. In some ways, one's expectation would be that uh, putting reflective particles in the stratosphere or, or elsewhere on the Earth that would cool it down would have a different climate signature, climate impact, from the effect you get of putting CO2 in the atmosphere, which warms it up. And in, indeed, this is some uh, uh, calculations that Ken Caldera did. And the original version of these calculations started, I think, about 10 years ago when uh, there was a conference in which somebody was maybe overselling this idea and Ken and others stood up at the back and said, no, no, this, this really won't work because the climate, what we call the climate forcing that you get from um, the, the cooling by, by, say, putting sulfuric acid in the stratosphere is different from CO2 warming. And um, Ken actually went back to try and prove how it wouldn't work and effectively, I wouldn't say prove the opposite, but showed that at least in one climate model it works surprisingly well. So this is a kind of classic standard climate model simulation showing temperature change at, at time of CO2 doubling, or actually for a CO2 doubling. And this is the amount of temperature change where you s effectively turn down the sun, put some um, uh, uh, reflective particles in the atmosphere. This model actually didn't put reflective particles in, but there are lots of models that now have done that and attempted to do the stratospheric chemistry, at least the beginning of it. And th the bottom line is this compensation is better than many of us expected. So now I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but it's still inherently imperfect. Uh, you probably can't read this slide, but I'll just say a little bit about this work and then talk you through it. Uh, it's the one little digression that's more technical in this talk. So there, there's been so little serious research in this topic because there's not an organized research program asking clearly articulated questions in a balanced way that there's a bunch of things people assume to be true that may not be true. So one thing that's out there that there have been some very strong statements about is that this uh, is inherently very, very unequal. So for example, if we cool down the rich world, say, uh, North America, by putting reflective particles in the atmosphere, we might stop precipitation of the Indian monsoon and um, you know, threaten the food supply of billions of people, for example. And uh, I'm not saying that that's definitely not true. There certainly are risks and inequalities, but it appears to be much less of an issue than you might think based on the actual climate models that we've looked at. So this is examples where we've looked in some standardized uh, regions, or about 20 standard regions that are used to look at temperature and precipitation responses in climate models. And so we just sort of followed the standard methodology that people who look at climate impacts have done. And we looked at the amount the temperature and precipitation changed when we put CO2 in the air. And then we looked at how they changed when you uh, added some some uh, uh, sulfur to the stratosphere in this model and looked at how unequal it was. And the first thing you see just in general, even, even if you can't read the details in the graph, is the temperature column on the, on the right there, the blue is, is what you get with increased CO2, and the, the red is what happens after you've compensated away. The compensation is pretty good for precipitation less well. Now I'm going to take you through a series of, of diagrams that look at the trade-off of, of these two quantities. Um, and, and you can think of these trade-offs as between could, could be between a range of things. And I want to say this because it, it, this gets at some of the key political and, and 
political and geopolitical trade-offs that we may really face. So imagine you have two regions, and I'll call them, here they're called region A and region, region B. And this could be uh, Chinese, uh, uh, China and India, for example, and it could be that China is worried, in fact, there is evidence the Chinese leadership is worried about a weakening monsoon strength um, that could impact their crop productivity. And it could be that they would think that they might be able to increase that monsoon strength by, by uh, um, uh, putting cloud whitening particles in the ocean off China. This is a perfectly sensible, physically sensible thing to do. I'm not saying it's necessarily a politically sensible thing to do. Um, and there's a possibility it might work. That might also make the Indian monsoon worse, or the Indians might think it would make it worse. And we have no method of settling that. There's no international treaty that deals with how we do that. And so there are obvious significant political concerns that come from this enormous power that we have over the uh, 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 climate that comes from these technologies. So again, look at these two regions. And the blue line there, I know you can't see this very well, is the CO2-driven warming. So that warms up region A and region B for a given amount of CO2, but warms them unequally. The red line is some amount of sulfur put in the atmosphere, which again cools the regions, but does it unequally, and unequally in a different way. So if I add the two together, I warm them up with the, with the CO2, the blue line, and I cool it down with the red line, I don't get back where I started. I can't get back where I started. So I can vary the amount of sulfur that I add, or whatever it, solar radiation management SRM technique I'm doing, so I could do more. Uh, more of the um, SRM, and for example, I could make things exactly back to the way they were for region B. But in this case, I've left region A still quite a bit too warm. Or maybe if region A is in charge, region A might want to go all the way to here and try and uh, uh, bring things back to the way they were, to the way their agriculture had already adapted to make things just right uh, uh, for region A, but that leaves region B quite a lot cooler and also it would be quite a lot drier with less precipitation and region A might not like that. So there are some real trade-offs here that aren't easy. Uh, you could imagine some optimum between those two things. Now these are just diagrams. The question is, what really is the angle there? Because that is a simple way to say how effective, how unequal is solar radiation management. Maybe the arrows look like this, where they're really not pointing in the same direction at all. So that in, if the situation was like this, this SRM would be, uh, any amount of it would make things worse for region A, but it would make region B better off. So one simple, simplistic in some ways, way to phrase the question of how important the inequality in solar radiation management is, is to sort of think about what is the angle between these vectors. So we did that using a, a standard climate model in these 22 regions, and we did it in this sort of 22-dimensional space because 22 regions, but don't worry, I'm not going to try and picture that. And I'm just going to give you the number. And the number is that the inequality is much less than we thought. The real picture looks a little bit like my tiny diagram in the lower right there. The angle's very small, implying that, in fact, in this model, and this model might not be reality, well, it certainly isn't reality and might be grossly wrong. In this model, the compensation that we had, this is the Hadley Center model, the compensation is very accurate. So another way to say it is that, uh, um, assuming we want to, one thing, so we've got these 22 regions, how do we weight them? We could weight them by wealth. We could weight them by land area, we could weight them by population. I mean, it depends if you're an egalitarian or a unitarian, <laughs> utilitarian, whatever. So, so, for example, we could adjust the amount of SRM to reduce changes in precipitation on a population-weighted basis. And we, if we do that, we can reduce the average change in precipitation across all these regions, the average squared change, uh, by 97%, reduce it to 3%, which is stunningly good compensation. And if we do that, purely tuning it to make the, to do the best for precipitation on a population-weighted basis, we still get 70%, 69% effectiveness doing it for temperature on a wealth-weighted basis. And I can give you lots of combinations like that. And a, if you want, I can give you a draft paper that has this. Um, the point, basically, is that the compensation is much better than people thought. Now, it may turn out that this is wrong. But this is the central argument why we need to actually do some work here. Because what we have is a bunch of preconceptions, some which may turn out to be right, and some which may turn out to be wrong, which will, and in some ways are already, shaping people's perceptions about the way the politics will play out. We had a, a big meeting that Ken and I were both involved in and organizing at the Kavli Center that the UK Royal Society, the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, and Third World Academy of Sciences organized to begin uh, conversations on geoengineering governance. And those conversations, many of them kind of assume that there's a huge amount of inequality. That may or may not actually be the case. Uh, so to, to get closer to wrapping up here, I mentioned before there are these three uh, sort of central facts, that it's fast, that it's cheap, and that it's imperfect. And each of those has policy consequences. 
the fact that it is cheap, in some ways it's a good thing. I mean, it's good to have something that's potentially environmentally, uh, environmental protection on the cheap is surely good. But the, the, the scary thing about it being cheap is it means that almost any state could in principle do this. So it leaves a possibility for kind of rapid, ill-thought-out action that concerns many of us. So I would say that unlike the challenge that we have in coordinating uh, well, national or global action on cutting emissions, where we have a substantial shared burden. So the, the issue for cutting emissions is each state or each province or however you want to say has to spend money to cut emissions and, and the benefits of that are spread globally in, in space and, and spread in the future in time. Uh, for this, the challenge is probably controlling the action essentially of, of what we want to call rogues. I mean, somebody else's, one person's good actors, of course, another person's rogue, but basically controlling or, or managing the actions of uh, in a multipolar world where there's no single state in control and where because this is so cheap, any state could at least in terms of cost in principle do this. And that raises some pretty profound concerns in terms of the sort of global climate policy and the connection to global climate policy and global security concerns. Um, so I think the central policy challenge here is really more one of control than of cost. So in, in economist terms, I would say that unlike decisions about reducing emissions, which are really classic cost benefit kind of calculations. Here, this is really a risk to risk calculation. The cost is so small, it's not really the issue. The issue is doing this uh, has a lot of potential benefits. Uh, I'm not, by the way, I should say, I am not and nobody I know who's sensible is proposing we should do this now. What we're talking about is that we might do some research on it. And if the research showed that it made sense, and of course the research might show that it didn't make sense, then some decades later, people might want to do it under some circumstances. But the point is that, that um, the fact that it's cheap gives you high leverage. The fact that it's fast means that you can do it after you find out that the climate sensitivity, the amount the climate changes for a given amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is worse than you think. One of the fundamental challenges in climate policy is we don't know how bad the problem is. We have to make decisions now about how much to cut emissions. And in practice, our decision collectively as a species over the last few decades has been to do nothing. So we're making a decision whether we like it or not about how much to cut emissions but we don't know how bad the problem is. It could be the problem is really severe. It could be the amount of CO2 we already have in the air is enough to pose really, really large risks in the future. Uh, or it could be the problem isn't so bad. That's the scientific uncertainty we don't know for sure. And the problem is we're making the decisions about how much CO2 to put in the atmosphere now, and we're gonna find these consequences out later, and we have no way to go backwards without things like this. So the potential benefit of SRM is it allows you to act once you know how bad the problem is, and that's potentially useful and important. And in that sense, it does something fundamentally different from cutting emissions. So a common answer, a common question and reaction that one gets when one talks about this is say, why don't you just cut emissions? Well, the answer is we must cut emissions. I spent a lot of my career trying to urge people to cut emissions, but they're not the same thing. Cutting emissions reduces the amount of CO2 we add to the atmosphere. It does nothing to reduce the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere. Cutting emissions reduces the future growth of risk, of climate risk. It doesn't deal with the climate risk we have. And so these technologies are different. They don't perfectly substitute for each other. Finally, there's the fact that it's imperfect. And, and while I showed you some evidence that it's not as imperfect as people generally think, it certainly is not perfect. For example, these solar radiation management techniques do nothing to deal with the uh, uh, geochemical impacts of CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 itself acidifies the ocean, causes lots of impacts that have nothing to do with climate. This won't help with those. Th while, while it may not be as imperfect as some people think, it's still definitely imperfect. And what that means, the consequence of that in policy terms, is this can never perfectly substitute for cutting emissions. So a natural thing that some people think is they say, well, if this is cheap and it more or less works, why not just do it and forget about cutting emissions? The answer is if we really did pursue that as a policy, we would walk further and further away from the current climate with more and more CO2 in the air, forcing ourselves to do more and more sulfur in the stratosphere, and, and basically getting ourselves into a more and more dangerous situation. So I think that imperfection means that that's not a long-term solution. So I'll skip that, I think. I can come to, I'm gonna skip a few slides here and come to a, a slide of, of my own views about what might make sense in terms of near-term sort of guidance for a US federal research program. These aren't the AMS's views or my institutions, it's just my views. Um, so the first thing is that I think we should act soon. And the reason is that there's a policy vacuum. So by setting up a formal research program, you set, you set a framework. You set goals, you set oversight, you set a, a, a broad framework that influences lots of things. 
Right now we have a bit of a vacuum. We have uh, research programs starting up elsewhere. There's now a, a European Union one, there's a British one, there's some German ones starting up. There's private research money flowing, but there's, and there is, to be clear, some US federal money is supporting this research through existing programs, but there's no organized program, there's no program manager. And uh, what that means is there's a real vacuum, and I think there's a limited window. So if the US federal government wants a kind of first mover advantage or near to first mover advantage where it gets to define some of what a public interest you know, and US interest uh, 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 SRM research program should look like, the window to do that is pretty short and, and, and it's closing. So that's a reason to act fast. Second thing I would say is I think we should act modestly. There are people who will tell you we should have a giant Manhattan project like SRM research program. I personally think that would be really foolish. For one thing, research programs can be killed by getting too much money too quickly especially in this situation where the thing is controversial, where there's a limited amount of high quality science because there hasn't been funding. If you put a huge amount of money into this very quickly, I think you'd probably end up funding a lot of research that was really uh, not well thought out and the whole thing might well collapse some years later. So I think acting modestly is really important. It's better to crawl before you try to walk and, and to actually give you a number. I think that a, a useful research program could start with as little as something like $10 million a year. That, what, what that, that tells you something profound, that the issue isn't a new allocation of money at the federal level. There's you know, lots of pots around this town where there's potentially that kind of money. The issue is, is sort of formal permission and the kind of um, authority that comes from having a program. And that's what I think is really quite important. The third guideline that I think is crucial is to act openly. Because of these, um, I mean, at this point, all I believe we should be doing is just research, not anything to do with actually implementing it. But there are legitimate reasons why even doing the research raises concerns about future implementation. And here you can draw some lessons from the, the work that was done in the nuclear security arena, where there's lots of evidence that certain kinds of transparency can be stabilizing because you get these situations just like we have in the kind of classic Cold War prisoner's dilemma world where one state can assume, has to assume the worst about another state, or at least that's the conventional view, and so you can get uh, 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 dangerous situations that come from misunderstanding. And I think that there's a profound benefit to acting openly. And what that means to me is that we shouldn't start a research program that's a purely narrowly technical research program. We must have it coupled both to a social science agenda that looks at some of these equity and governance uh, issues in a serious way and in a way that, that doesn't get, produce a single answer but gives a diversity of views. And second, that we need a way that this research program has some input uh, from a broad set of stakeholders, from, from a, you know, a variety of political views and, and social views and so on, and that we need to essentially learn how to manage eventual decisions we're gonna to have to make about deployment, which may be decisions not to do it, I'm not presupposing what the decision should be, by managing research agenda. So managing research is like the training wheels for decisions we'll have to make about deployment. I think the worst case would be where we kind of all agree to look the other way and pretend this is impossible. People develop a kind of fits and starts research program that may make this look better than, than it really is. And then we have some supposed climate crisis and perception of reality 20 or 30 years out and people want to act suddenly in a way that's ill thought out and dangerous. And I think that the way to prevent that is to have a more systematic open research program. It doesn't have to be large at the beginning, but I think that's crucial. I guess I'd say it, it's easy for technologists to be too uh, rosy about their technology. I think one thing we'll find with a systematic research program is we'll see more warts. We'll see more ways this doesn't work quite as well as we think. It's not quite as simple as we think, and that's a good thing. That complexity will sort of make this conversation richer. The last comment and the last comment of this talk is keep it simple. There's no reason to connect up all these dots into one massive organized program. And in particular, this uh, idea, solar radiation uh, management, has, I think, essentially no useful connections to carbon dioxide removal, the first talk, uh, except that they're both you know, important levers of climate policy, but they're not more connected to each other than either of them are to, uh, to abatement, reducing emissions, or to um, adaptation. And so while, well, of course, they ultimately should all be connected in a sensible climate strategy, in terms of research management, there's no pressing need to couple them up, and there are lots of disadvantages to coupling them up. So partly we've been really saddled by the power of a word. There's this word out there, geoengineering. So when Paul Higgins organized this talk, he 
he thought we should talk about both for geoengineering and and we're, there are many many committees and various research programs that now deal with that word and yet it's not clear that the things under it are really linked by anything substantial so I as the last thing I urge us to really think about these in a decoupled way thank you very much Thank you.